Okay, we are recording. Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to dig into these parables. So he starts with his first parable. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And I just want to stop right there. And so this is the first parable he gives. And for the first and the second of the parables, he actually tells you exactly what he's talking about. So I don't need to explain that one to you. But the reason that he's telling, he's explaining scriptures and he's explaining his teachings in parables was he was talking to the common people. And if he were just giving it to them straight out, straight out of his heart and straight out of like some very complex scripture, it kind of would have went whoosh, right over their head. When you're speaking to a child, which we all come to God as a child. So these are people that are just barely learning about this, the gospel. So he's giving them milk. And as we get older and more mature in our walk, we're able to have meat. So we're able to tolerate it without just the stories. We're able to get the full gospel. So he's explaining it to them as you'd explain to a child because they wouldn't be able to absorb it, they would like get zoned out on it. They, would, they wouldn't have been able to take the message and they would have probably tuned out. But the way he was speaking, it held their interest because he was speaking of things that were very familiar to them because they were all farmers. They were all familiar with raising cattle and raising um, grains and all that. So this, this is why he did this. And then he says, verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak in parables? To them and he answered them to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given for to the one who has more will be given and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away that is why i speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You indeed will hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed. Least they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. But, and he goes back to his own speech, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and for your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Okay, so he's, he's explaining it to him. It's like, People just, they just don't get it. They're, they're not capable. They're just coming into their walk here. And he's saying like people, like in Moses' time, in Noah's time, they would have loved to have heard the Messiah speak the truths. They would have loved to, but they didn't have that opportunity. So he's saying, you guys are very fortunate that you're able to hear me talk about all this and about heaven and about the possibility of people being saved, which was unheard of before he came. Now, he's explaining that first parable, the parable of the sower, verse 18. 
Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So this is a great example of, of people that we even see today in, in our walk. We see people who, who can hear the word and they're all excited and they're all pumped up about it on Sunday, and then they forget about it on Monday and they don't do anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. Or people who hear the word and they're all excited about it, but hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to play the lotto. I want to win all this money or I, I, my eyes are on the car here that I really want or your eyes are on the things of the world and you cannot worship God and money. You can only worship. You can only have one God. It should be God, right? So he just gives a great description here. And I just, I love so much how Jesus explains them that I wish he would do that for every one of them, <laughs> but he does not. So here we go. Then he gave them the second parable. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And his servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. But he, then the servant said to them, Do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, least in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And I'm not going to explain that one to you either, because Jesus is going to explain it in a second. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the mustard seed and the leaven. So we're, we're at, these are called twin parables, these next two. So verse 31. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed, which is about this tiny, the tiniest of all seeds, right? That a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So, We've all heard about faith like a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. And you can start with, so we can plant that seed and that little tiny seed of faith and belief in God can grow to something so powerful that, that we, can, we can be responsible for feeding others the gospel. We can like become huge. Our church can become huge if we have the faith of a mustard seed. That is key and that's so important. And when you see churches that aren't fruitful, they don't have that seed. That, that's not what's going on there. So, so the, that's so key for the growth of any of us, right? And this is the twin to it. And he told, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. So we all know that a little bit of leaven is what can take flour and make it rise up and make it become this beautiful loaf of bread. And without it, it's flat. So 
a little bit of leaven goes a long way. So it just takes a little wee bit to add into this flour. So the flour can be seen as the world, as our friends and family, and we can be seen as the leaven. We add a little bit of ourselves to them. We should be like increasing their faith and they should be increasing other people's faith and so on and so on and so on. Like a pebble in the pond. I mean, we can make beautiful things happen just by sharing the good news with people. So we need to be that leaven. Leaven that's not used, it's useless and, and it will rock. So we need to make sure our leaven isn't staying in a jar and, and just not going anywhere. Verse 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So that's exciting stuff. He's sharing things that no one, Noah didn't hear it, Moses didn't hear it, Abraham didn't hear it. He's sharing things that are just like mind-blowing. And he's giving people just hope that they hadn't had before. I mean, he's just really given it to them in such a way that they're just like, they had to have just been just in awe hearing him share these, this good news that he was sharing. All right, now he explains the parable of the weeds, verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears, let him hear. Okay, so that's a very powerful message. And, and these kinds of messages really strike me the hardest, I think, because the weeping, the gnashing of teeth, the everlasting burning, the, the absence from, from God, I don't want that for anyone. I don't want that for any of my family, my friends, any, any of anybody. I don't want anybody to suffer that. And it's just a matter of like, listen to what we're saying and understand that Jesus is your savior. You know, it's like, it, it really makes me want to just shake people and just so that they would hear it. And it, it's mm -hmm. frustrating when they don't take that message because it's like, you don't understand. This is, this is more than life or death. This is eternal life or eternal death. Yeah. <laughs> it's scary stuff and it, and it frightens me for people. Okay. Verse 44. All right, now we're getting into some that he's not explaining, so we'll see how I do here. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay, so these next three are, are kind of similar. So he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and, and how... In your joy, you sell all, you give all that you have to have that kingdom of heaven, to, to, to be in that space, right? Which Jesus explains over and over again, like sell everything you own and follow me. It's like, give up the things of the world and follow me. And it's like, that's so key here. And it's a message that's lost on a lot of people because everybody is so worldly focused. And what's here for us? I mean, it, it's like, we're here this much, but eternity is forever. And it's like, and that's where all the good stuff is, right? Yeah. Verse 45, he's given another one similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So he's comparing heaven with this one pearl of great value. 
And again, selling everything you have and focusing on that, the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's how focused we should be on God and on the kingdom. All right, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, that's, that's some powerful, scary stuff that we don't want our friends and family there. We don't want them in that furnace. We don't want them, the angels, to toss them out with the bad. We want them to be collected into the good containers, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Then he says to the disciples, oh, yes, go ahead, Tom. Can I say something about, you know, hell, hell keeps coming up, hell fire keeps coming up? Yes. And uh, it's, uh, a lot of Bible scholars will tell you that the biggest thing about hell is its separation from God. And, and that they suspect that Jesus was using earthly terms to try to get us some idea of what it would be to be someplace right. that with no love, no peace, no joy, no patience, no goodness, no gentleness, no faithfulness, and no self-control, where none of those things, the fruit of the Spirit, exist. And if you can imagine a place like that without any of those things, it would be horrible. Oh. And, and uh, But I think that that's a depth of sorrow and depression that many people many scholars would say that's what he's explaining by using the lake of fire now a lot of people also take it literally as well but to me being a place where there's no love no kindness no peace no joy no patience none of those things none of it not even a hint of it is bad enough to make me not want to be there <laughs> and, and uh, I just uh, I, 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 I tend to approach people from the fact that rather being afraid that you're going to be thrown in a fiery lake of fire or a lake of yeah, fiery anyway to be scalded all the time is one thing but just try to imagine if you will you don't even have to go there you can just imagine the total and absolute absence of of God, the total and absolute absence of goodness of any kind. Imagine the depth of depression that that would yeah. would be like. And uh, I, I, for me, it's just that's something people can grasp maybe more completely. But anyway, that's I'm just sorry. I just uh, I'm not saying oh that's just that's not true. It may very well be a lake of fire. But if you really think about it, a lake of fire wouldn't be, eternal fire would not be any worse than being completely absent from anything good at all, ever, or eternity. And, and to me, that's, that lends to the gnashing of teeth and being on the outside uh, of, of any goodness. So, I'm sorry, that's my two cents. Has anybody seen What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams? What is it? What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. It's oh, a I don't think I've ever seen that. A movie about purgatory. And it, oh, it, it, yes, I have. And then heaven is a real flower. Yeah. Place, pretty cool. yeah. yeah. I did see that. I don't remember it very well, but I, yeah. His wife was in just complete and utter darkness and cold, and she was screaming and gnashing her teeth. And it was like, it was a very powerful picture. <laughs> I'm like, ooh. Yeah. So I get you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Verse 51, and Jesus asks the disciples, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes. First of all, I want to stop right there. So they said yes, even though they, you know, they asked him to explain both of those other parables. <laughs> so maybe they were just saying yes because they didn't want to look stupid. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I don't really think that they totally understood them all. I think they were just like, yes, Master, we understand <laughs> So, I mean, I, I feel okay in that they, they kind of confused me a little bit, too. Verse 52, and he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven 
is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. So he's kind of comparing his, his disciples to the scribes and, and being trained for heaven. And, and, and this is another one of those that it's kind of a little bit confusing to me, but the way that it's worded. So I won't dig into it too deeply. If you want to add anything, Tom, to that one, you're willing. You're uh, I've never spent much time on this, actually. Uh, so he replied, this means then that every teacher of the law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who takes new and old things out of the storage room. It's just a blessing for that. You shall, you shall save for yourself treasures in heaven. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Store up like for your like treasures of heaven. And I, so that jumps out at me when I read that. I love that storing for yourself treasures in heaven. That helps. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And the last paragraph it is one that's pretty sad to me. Verse 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor in, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And that's powerful. That's like, they were like, they were, they were almost like the Pharisees against him. They were like, yeah, you don't even, they didn't believe him. They they didn't give him any credit. They're like, yeah, you're, we've known you all your life. There's no way that you could know all these things. They just, and, you know, he was like, fine, you know, shake off my sandals and I'll move on to the next town. And, and they missed out on people having, you know, sight restored to them. They missed out on people getting saved in that community because of their unbelief. And it's just, you wonder how many communities and how many households, because of their unbelief, they, you know, that he's not with that honor in their homes too, that, that he just like shakes his sandals off and keeps going and passes by people because they just are so, they're, they're mocking him. They're, they don't believe in him. They don't think that what he says could be true. And it's just, uh, well, it's think really about, bad. think about, think about when he came home and they asked him, they let him speak in a synagogue and he reads to them out of Isaiah. And it's the prof the Isaiah is prophesying the, the, Messiah coming, and he just, he reads the scroll, and then he says, I'm that guy. <laughs> and so what do they do? Oh, praise God. So the Messiah is from our hometown. <laughs> yay, yay, Jesus. No. Yeah. Hey, let's throw him off a cliff, right? Yeah, that was sure. the response. <laughs> yeah. 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 They thought it was blasphemy. They did. And how yeah. sad. How sad for them mm -hmm. that they missed it. Yeah. But he was so opposed with his loving attitude to all the hard-hearted callousness of the law mm -hmm. that him and the law didn't seem to mesh, although he was the fulfillment of the law. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. So, William, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. One of the... Uh... One of the parables, it's interesting, it said uh, the parable of the net teaches the same general lesson, lesson as the parable of the weeds. There will be a final separation of the righteous and the wicked. The parable of the weeds also emphasizes that we are not to try to make such a separation now. That is entirely the Lord's business. Yeah. Well, I've been in contact with a 90-year-old atheist most of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it up to God to take care of it. I think I'm wasting my time. but So, so I'm going to leave it up to God. He'll separate them out, won't he? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. You're, I think you know who I'm talking about, huh, Avery? Your faith and persistence are amazing to me, William. I, 
I couldn't oh. keep coming back at someone who, who kept like refuting me and arguing with me. I mean, you thank God for people like you that, that are so patient and persistent. <laughs> well, I've got him. I've got him. Going, he's going to, I'm going to send him uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, uh, The Kingdom of Heaven, because he wants me to read a book that is uh, the atheist book uh, uh, that is was written by... Uh, I think it's called, uh, <laughs> I, I, well, I, I haven't ordered it, but I might, but uh, uh, Sapiens, he's a Hindu, wrote it, and he's a devout atheist. So anyway, I read the reviews on it, and the people were just thumbs down. It's just a bunch of BS from somebody that has a big, long, all these PhDs uh, piled higher and deeper behind his name. So anyway, he wrote it, and that's who this 90-year-old said, oh, you've got to read that, and then you'll understand why I'm an atheist. So I said, okay, I'll read it, but I'm going to send you the business of heaven. Nice. <laughs> Friends, I wasted my time with him today. I wasted all a half a day with him. So I, I got behind <laughs> out there. <laughs> anyway. It's not a waste, Bill. I've got a question for that. Absolutely. It's so sure. I, I really are you familiar? Are you familiar with a book called uh, uh, "Case for Christ" by Leo Strobel? If this guy thinks of himself as any kind of a of a, uh, a scholar or thinks he's pretty smart, this that would be a great book. And I, no, I, I give a lot of those away. It's called no, a, case by, "A Case for Christ" by Leo Strobel, and he was a atheist. A, yeah, he was an atheist, and he was a, well agnostic, uh, but he was a uh, reporter crime reporter in the city of Chicago and, uh, and investigative reporter. And so he attacked the question about Christ from a position of a, uh, really like I think probably has some, quite a few awards as an investigative reporter. And he uh, didn't go at it with a predis with a predecided uh, predisposed position. He went out and tried to prove Either way, he didn't care. He was just trying to get to the bottom of whether Christ existed and came away a really strong Christian. And uh, his book has won a lot of people who think they're pretty smart over. And uh, it might, if I don't know, does this guy think he's of himself as being pretty scholarly? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he's, he said he's, he's done real well his whole life without, he doesn't need God. And he learned that when he was in a teenager. And so he doesn't need God and it's all BS and it's all lies. According to him, it's everything is a lie made up by mankind has been made up by mankind since the beginning of time. But anyway, uh, I sent you an email, uh, Pastor Tom on this uh, book called Sapien. You don't have to even deal with it because I looked it up and it's the biggest bunch of BS that was ever created by an individual. So, uh, <laughs> I was just asking if you'd ever heard of it. So anyway, you don't have to bother with it because I. You know, I watched it. I watched this show here some months back and I, I try to stay away from this stuff, but I, I, it was on the big bang theory. And I thought, okay, I feel like I'm strong enough at this point where no matter what they say, it's not going to chisel away at my faith. I just rolled my eyes and laughed all the way through it. It's like such a crock. There, there's, what's that, Expelled? Yeah. Oh, that's a great little movie put together about this stuff. And uh, about creationism versus, what do they call themselves? Big, big, bad theory yeah. people and, and uh, evolution. evolution. You know that for the evolution, all the evolutionists have one thing in common. They'll tell the story that, well, there was a big explosion and then something happened. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's their scientific premise. Something happened. And then they just leap right into this thing where they just paint this picture about what they think happened. But the something that happened is God, you numbskulls. <laughs> that's the something that happened. Something happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they actually say those words, all of them. Well, there was a big bang, and then, you know, all this stuff went flying around, and then something happened. That's their link. 
it, it's dead without them. And and uh, once you realize that, it's like okay, that's something else. <laughs> well, I I tried to say to him about. So I sent you folks and everybody in my email list the thing on the, the little dogs and cats and the little animals that were uh, taking care of one another. And it's a very precious thing. So he wrote me back and said, thank you for that. Uh, and I said, well, I only sent it just to show you what, what, what is so precious in our lifetime. But I wanted to say to him, so you believe that two little amoebas got together back at the Big Bang Theory and that's what created this this thing that we have, this wonderful life we have and the gift of life was created by two little amoebas bumping into one another after the Big Bang. So anyway, that's that's the atheist stand and just what you said, something happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to create the amoebas. That, yeah. That's where the something has to come in. Right. right. <laughs> there has to be amoebas. <laughs> where did the amoeba come from? Yeah. Yeah. Well, something happened, clearly. Something happened. <laughs> I like that. All right, gang. All right. I didn't mean to hold you there, Avery. So it's quite uh, all right. Sunday. Okay, everybody have a blessed evening. Yeah. Thank you, you too, Thank you Avery. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Yeah. Bye, Bill. Good night, Pastor Tom.